Hey guys, Chris from the Ultimate Recycler. We're out and about today and I'm going to take you on a little bit of a history tour. I'm in my hometown of Matoa, which is a small rural farming town in Victoria in Australia. And behind me is the famous stick shed. Now it's famous to us because we've known it all our lives and it's now getting some good promotion. It's now heritage listed. Uh, you may not have heard of it, but come with me and have a look. It's a pretty amazing building. Now let's drive down the driveway here. The, um, the shed, and I might say this throughout the video, the shed is pretty hard to appreciate its grandeur from just driving past on the road or even driving up a little driveway to it now. It's uh, a colossal shed and I'll talk a little bit about the history when we're in there and a few stats that I can remember. But uh, it's pretty amazing. It's been on the, it's, it's an icon really. They're talking about it as an icon of rural Australia. It's becoming more and more known now that it's open to the public for tourism. Uh, even though there's not many tourists come to this part of the world, it is attracting a lot of attention. Uh, if you want to know more, I think there's a website. You could probably Google it. Just Google Matoa Stick Shed. But as we get closer, you can see that the checker plate of um, patterns from the galvanized iron on the roof of it and you appreciate how big the thing is when you imagine you know these are big sheets of galvanized iron and they just look like tiny little shingles uh, there's a few places obviously where there's been repairs and I'll talk about that once we get inside but yes it's a pretty amazing building okay we're getting closer let's go and have a look inside it's um the closer you get the more daunting this building is it's just amazing I've just been past the offices and they've got a little museum room and the video is playing on its history but uh, you'll see in a minute why it's called the stick shed. Uh, this end of it uh, is the main Melbourne Adelaide railway line with branch lines for loading of the wheat. A uh, huge wheat growing area around here which I may have mentioned and this end is some big elevators that used to actually put the wheat into the top of the building and then also they would uh, discharge the wheat into the train carriages back in the day when trains were absolute king of transport so um, that was would have been a loading bay but let's go and have a look in now the the camera is not going to capture the grandeur of this building it's just absolutely phenomenal um, and to think that it was just really knocked together in a rush let's go in hopefully the camera adjusts and hopefully I haven't got too much noise and you can see it's like a forest uh, there's a bit of noise from the I think the elevators are still working up there I think the grain elevators board still use this end or um, whatever their name is these days grain elevators board I'm not sure but um, they still need access to the railway line for loading I think sometimes but the rest of this is now just empty and it's like a massive indoor cathedral uh, and I did read some stats on this building um, I think there's 560 uh, unmilled mountain ash poles so they're basically tree trunks and it's all braced with wire cables and it's been described as a, a an indoor cathedral of sorts and we'll get it out to the middle because we can look down these uh, aisles if you like uh, now what else was I reading the um, I think this is the center one yes you can see the conveyor up top there which used to bring the wheat along and just basically dump it off and fill the shed up now the stats I think I read that the roofing iron alone on the top was uh, 150 tons of corrugated iron so there's a lot of sheets of corrugated iron and at one stage the building was quite dilapidated when it wasn't being looked after and quite a lot of the sheets blew off in a storm well not all you know there was a decent hole in one side and the pres preservation of the building meant that they because they were scrambling to save it a lot of people wanted to knock it down and they had to put wire netting over the top to stop more of the roof blowing away so um, a massive effort to save it and it very nearly wasn't saved so yeah there's 560 timber poles here mountain ash poles and it's all concrete floor and the amazing thing with this building I'm just walking down at the moment um, just a quick glance back I've only really just started I'm not even halfway 
and they built this building in uh, during the first, Second World War, so about 1941, for emergency grain storage. And uh, apologies if I'm doubling up on these facts because uh, I'll film the introduction a bit later. So emergency grain storage during the war because they couldn't um, access the export market and Victoria or Australia, I believe, had some bumper crop years in the 1940s. So this was built as emergency storage and the amazing fact that this whole building was built with very minimal uh, mechanised equipment and not a huge labour force because a lot of the men were off to war and it was built in four months. And that's just amazing. I mean, how would you go to try and get something built? Geez, you're struggling to get your garage built at home with permits and everything in four months these days. So I'm just walking along at a fairly steady walking pace and I don't think we're maybe about halfway. Now I forget the figures, I think it's over 200 and, or it might be 250 metres long, I don't remember that. Uh, a fairly wide and the roof structure was built to exactly the same angle as what a pile of wheat naturally sits at so that it could basically be full to the top and the angle of the slope of the wheat pretty well matches the roof so it can be pretty well full. So I don't remember many other stats to tell you other than I'll tell you if you're in Victoria and you're looking for somewhere to visit this is just amazing to call in and see. They have had some weddings in here now that it has been saved and it has a heritage listing, uh, it's there's some money going towards re keeping it restored. Uh, and the, it's now open every day, I believe, I think from 10 till two, might be longer on weekends. And that raises some funds as well. There's been, I think there's been markets in here, there's been concerts in here. They have had at least one wedding. Uh, and I'm sure they're going to you know, there's a committee set up to manage it and uh, obviously maintain it and obviously promote it. I think there is a Matoa Stick Shed website, so look it up if you want to find out some more of the history. Um, there's pigeons living here too, which make a little bit of a mess. Now, I can remember coming in here as a kid because my farm, my family farm, isn't far away. In fact, you can see the stick shed from my farm. And we used to come in as kids sometimes when... Uh, Dad or my grandfather were bringing wheat up to the silos here and you could come in the indoor and basically play in a massive mountain of wheat. So I've been walking for, just looking at my phone, I've been walking for about five minutes and prattling on and we've just gone past halfway. So it's a lot of poles, it's a lot of concrete, it's a lot of space and there's lots of little holes through the tin, it must leak a little bit. It almost looks like a starry night. But it's good that they've um, been putting some money in to save it. Uh, the land, I think, at one stage they wanted the land for more traditional silos and, and more bunkers for, I think it's a more efficient way of storing wheat. And they don't put wheat in here anymore. Uh, but it is nice that it's been saved and there was a dedicated band of uh, volunteers that put in a lot of work. And I know uh, a mate of mine, Lee, was uh, one of the, the main drivers and they put, they put in decades of work, really, to, um, to try and save it. Uh, and it's great that it has been saved. Now, I'm just walking over to this side because hopefully the glare of that window doesn't muck up. There still is the conveyor belt system down this side, which when they were emptying it, I think they had little uh, auger type uh, conveyors with a, like some sort of pickup and it would then run the wheat across into this main conveyor at the end, at the side of the shed, sorry. It runs on big rollers. This hasn't turned for a long, long time. And let's take a peek down there, all the way down that end. And if we scan up here, it's even further down that way. So I can remember actually seeing this conveyor belt absolutely humming with a decent amount of wheat on it just traveling really fast and you put your hand in it and it kind of almost it'd be like putting your hand in a, a rapidly running stream of water except your hand obviously doesn't get wet so good memories for me and a great piece of australian history even though 1940s isn't sort of um perhaps as exciting to the people that like real history um certainly not as old as like your goldfields 
um, buildings and you know, stories from the really early days of Victoria. But you know, World War II is not that. I mean, it's quite a while ago now, and this is quite amazing in the fact that it was built uh, so quickly and with so uh, you know so few resources. And there was a few others built around Australia. I think there was some in WA and there might have been one or two in New South Wales. But this is the only remaining uh, bulk emergency grain storage from World War II left. And there was actually, believe it or not, there was a bigger one here right next door. And I can just remember seeing it and I've seen photos of it. And it was, wide, I think, a little wider than this one and it was quite a bit longer. And this one, if I remember rightly, I think this one held about 92,500 tonne of wheat and the other one held substantially more. I don't remember the figures. But they tore the other one down in the 70s. And I think in, the, in a great example of repurposing, I think every Matoa backyard got a new tin fence out of it because there was just so much materials. Uh, and I guess they tore it down because the space was a premium here. Before we uh, finish up, I might just see if I can drive around the other s part of the silos and show you uh, where all the farmers bring their grain. But uh, yeah, great part of great piece of history this building. All right, I'm walking back up towards the other end. We didn't get down down the full length of it, but uh, as I said before, the camera can't really capture the grandeur of this place. It's just pretty amazing. So, okay, I'll, um, yeah, before I finish up this video, I will do a bit of a quick lap around and show you the other silos here. Um, the Matoa silos, um, I think they're the largest inland grain receival facility, perhaps in Australia, uh, certainly in Victoria. Uh, I think Portland is bigger, but that's like a seaboard loading area whereas this is inland uh, Matoa is only a little town it's only oh it used to be a thousand people I think it's only about eight or nine hundred people now but a big farming community really good um, cropping area and that's why it's such a big complex here for handling grain so um, yeah I forgot my train of thought anyway I'll do a bit of a, a film around the other part of the silos before we leave and I hope you've enjoyed the uh, the history now before we go, I'll just do a drive around the rest of the uh, grain receival facility. It's probably changed a lot since I used to go here. It's called Grain Core now. Uh, it used to be the Grain Elevators Board. Uh, like all departments, uh, it's probably changed its name numerous times. But we just have to skirt around the shed now because it has been sort of sectioned off from the main grain receival point here. They don't obviously use it anymore, as I've discussed. And this has all changed a lot. When I was uh, oh, back in the 1980s when I was helping down on the farm a bit and I had my truck license, which I still do, I just don't have a truck. Um, I used to bring grain in here for dad uh, over harvest time and we had times where there was massive queues. There used to be a Weybridge right where we are now, that's all changed. Uh, and now they store a lot of grain in big bunkers. Now I'm not sure if I'm allowed to drive around here, but I guess I am until I'm told that I can't we just better not get in the way of a big truck but they use these bunkers a lot now uh, much cheaper storage they just lay out massive tarps dump the grain essentially on the ground or it's on a tarp and then they have it all weatherproofed and I have no idea what the capacity of this facility is but it's quite large uh, the other silos we've just come around the end of the stick shed now and you can see the other grain silos there I'm going to let it drive down that road um, and we used to, I used to bring the truck in here and sometimes unload in the bunkers and sometimes uh, there's a truck unloading in there now. I wonder if we can get close without getting into strife. Uh, and used to, I think the local farmers used to call this the Meccano set. You'd, you'd go and unload over the Meccano set. Um, just because it's a big construction of lots of metal bits and silos and bracing and ladders and all sorts of construction there and you you dumped your uh, the grain off up on top of that section there and there was a grate underneath and it obviously goes into a conveyor and it probably goes up that one into those silos there's another big shed over the other side which I think always used to be barley I don't know if it still is this has changed a lot since I was here but you know it's 40 nearly 40 years ago 
So this is where they handle the bulk of the grain now. Um, probably only specialist grains go into these silos. Uh, I'd say most of the wheat and general purpose grains now just go out in bunkers and uh, they're stored for however long they need to be stored and then they're uh, uh, trucked out again probably. I think I mentioned earlier that, that the rail isn't used so much anymore. There's a lot of, um, lot of big trucks carting grain these days and I think we can probably pan around here and see one still unloading. The guy's just getting in, he's just unloaded. Uh, it's a transport company from Horsham nearby. So harvest hasn't started here yet. We're still in October, the crops haven't been harvested. But at the peak times of the year, this place is absolutely buzzing. And I can remember pulling up in the 80s in the truck way down the main street of Matara. And I think it took nine hours in the queue to be able to get unloaded because trucks were being driven to this area from all over the district and when it's a bumper harvest there's um lots of lots of traffic lots of activity there's big front end loaders going everywhere there'd be guys setting up tarps and and uh, all sorts of stuff so anyway we've just skirted around the stick shed as i said oh, it still has wire i can still see that it's still got wire over the sheets of tin right across the roof to stop the roof blowing off but I believe they're getting a fair bit of funding now to keep it preserved, which is fantastic. Uh, certainly would be a shame to see it disappear, uh, especially since it's the last one in Australia. So all right, that'll do with this tour. Um, not really a lot about recycling, but I hope you appreciated the history. I hope you enjoyed the look around. And as I said earlier, if you're ever in the, air, in the district, um, come and have a look at the stick shed. It's well worth it. I think they charge dollars or something and it just it does help to go to help save the building and and it helps with general traffic around little Matoa township which probably needs all the help it can get all right thanks for watching guys we'll catch you in the next video bye for now